All right, this module is going to talk about polarized light microscopy. So this is again another subset of light microscopy and we use it to study specimens, a particular subset of specimens that exhibit what we call optical anisotropy. All right, so optical anisotropy, if you're unfamiliar with the anisotropy means, it means that there's variations in directions. So there's variations in the optical properties dependent on the different directions. So that's um, the opposite of what we would call isotropy. So take off the AN, and that means everything is the same in all directions. So all the optical properties are the same in all directions. So optical anisotropy arises um, when we have materials that either transmit or reflect lights and it does so at different uh, velocities in different directions and that's uh, that will manifest itself as differences in the refractive index so typically uh, these are non cubic crystal structures. So basically this is useful when we have non-cubic crystal structures because, and we'll talk about this in the next uh, major topic, is that cubic systems have a lot of symmetry and tend to be uh, isotropic, so all the same in all directions, whereas non-cubic would have more of this optical anisotropy. So this is what it's going to be useful for. So uh, before we get too, uh, too involved in this, um, I want you to uh, stop and, and go to the quiz for a second and see if you can answer uh, the, uh, quiz, uh, the quiz question uh, that is basically asking what metals can you think of that are non-cubic? So see if you can come up with some examples of non-cubic metals and also feel free to add in uh, non-metals. So if you want to put in ceramics or polymers that have non cubic crystal structures, feel free to do that as well. All right, now that you're back, let's take a look at this first question about metals with non-cubic structures. So now that you've had some time, so let me give you some examples that I came up with. And again, this isn't all of them, but uh, some of the common examples, uh, magnesium, Mg, zirconium, Zr, titanium, Ti, cobalt, ZO, zinc, cadmium. So those are some common ones. And one of the big ones is probably going to be titanium, at least in terms of uh, common metals. Titanium is definitely one of the most common that we see. All right, so obviously if you're dealing with a titanium sample, polarized light uh, is gonna be useful. Uh, but it also uh, is useful for other ceramics and polymers as well. So let's take a look um, at how polarized light microscopy looks. And so let me uh, start by just having a, a simple sketch for you that kind of illustrates how this works. So imagine I have a wave front. And so this isn't a picture of a wave, right? Uh, but this is just showing that we have um, a wave front and it's random so you can see it kind of in all directions here uh, and this is our incident which means it's our the 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 light that we start with so our incident waves and it's in all of these uh, directions so basically um, our light uh, normally vibrates in all directions uh, and this is uh, perpendicular to the propagation so it's going you know this way but it's vibrating in all directions so that's what normally the light would be so now uh, what we do is that we put a filter in its path and this filter is also known as a polarizer so what this does is it takes the light and it only allows vibration in one direction. So only 
light that is vibrating in this direction will be allowed to pass. So when we go to the other side of it, we'll only be left with this polarized transmitted light. Right. So this should ring a bell from the demo I did in the last class uh, where we looked at the Marillax through a set of polarizers. So you can hopefully see where we're going with this. All right, so in this way, we and so when you, and you, this will frequently be, uh, you'll see this frequently in uh, things on commercials and so forth that talk about sunglasses. When we talk about polarized light, this is the process that's happening. We're not allowing the light to, to pass through unless it's in this one direction. And so this is polarized light. And in particular, this is uh, what we call plain polarized. Not plain as in it's boring, but plain as in a single plane. All right, so let's look at the consequences of this. So uh, if we're looking at transparent crystals, then that term optical anisotropy that I brought up is also called double refraction or you might have heard of birefringence. So this is the same topic. So this means that the refractive indexes, indices, um, are different in two perpendicular directions. of the crystal. All right, so this is going to be related to that plain polarized light we just talked about. So let's take a look uh, at that. So again, this is my wave front. It's plain polarized, so it's only vibrating in one direction, so this is the direction. So now, when that encounters crystal, and let me draw a crystal, a very basic kind of rudimentary crystal here. So this is my crystal. So basically we have direct differences in this direction and this direction. So this is my high refractive index direction, and this is my low, so we're talking about this one over here. So those are my two uh, different um, planes in my birefringent crystal. And again, this is a simple diagram illustrating this. All right, so when the light, plane polarized light encounters uh, this crystal, what happens is we produce an ordinary wave so basically the light splits into two waves. Uh, an ordinary wave which is the same as the incident wave, same direction, and, but we also have a another one perpendicular which we call the extraordinary wave or extraordinary wave. So this is perpendicular to it, perpendicular to the incident wave, right? Comparing those.
All right, so let me switch over here. And so these ordinary and extraordinary waves in the different directions um, are also at different velocities because of that different refractive indexes in the two directions that we saw here. So what this does is that um, this means that the ordinary wave and the extraordinary wave have a phase difference because of these different velocities, right? Just like we saw in phase contrast. So that's uh, the result of having these two different directions. But in this case, they're perpendicular to each other. So it's not as straightforward um, as we saw with simple uh, plane uh, constructive inter and destructive interference with phase contrast. Here we have differences, and uh, let me go to the next slide here, because again, they're perpendicular. So if we look at the O and the E wave, ordinary and extraordinary, again, they are perpendicular to each other, so they're trying to draw that here. So they're perpendicular to each other, but then also have phase differences. And so the combination of those two waves now results in this weird elliptical path. And so this is the resultant wave after diffraction. So we have elliptically polarized light because of this, uh, this issue here. All right, so let's go through a, a couple cases that we can have. So if we have two polarized light waves with equal magnitude, let's say we have differences in uh, phase differences of lambda over two, uh, that's gonna give you a spiraling circle like you see here. Uh, if you have a phase difference of lambda over uh, two instead of four, uh, or sorry, uh, lambda over two will give you this spiraling elliptical. Uh, lambda over four will result in a spiraling circle. So that's what we have. So that's what we have here. So this basically just shows you the differences in the type of light that we see um, with different um, different phase differences. So lambda over two, lambda over four are the, the two that I, I showed you. And so what this also illustrates is we had this um, polarizer, right? That gave us the plane polarized light in one direction, but now we also have an analyzer. So we put another polarizer in the perpendicular direction behind the specimen. Again, this should be familiar. This is what I did with the Miralax demo. We had a polarizer in front and a polarizer in back um, at varying angles. And so that's what you were looking at in those cases. So in this case, we saw call that second one, the second polarizing filter, an analyzer. And this is what detects differences in the resultant light. So when we cross this, um, then the the amplitude of that, the resulting is the, the greatest, as we see here. Um, and then um, and then lowest at, at zero over over here. So you, you, you see that the this is showing the amplitude um, after the analyzer. So largest uh, for lambda over two, and then zero at the zero value here. So that's kind of the two extremes of this. But we can rotate with um, those positions, the rotational angle of the polarizer and the analyzer, and go through the maximum and minimum uh, in these cases. All right. So let's kind of go to what this does for us. So this is an example of polarized light microscopy used on pure titanium. So titanium, again, one of those non-cubic metals we talked about. If you go with normal bright field uh, imaging, uh, you have a grain structure that you can kind of see with some grain boundaries, but it's very hard to see. However, if we use polarized light 
uh, microscopy, the different uh, grains are revealed because uh, of the non-cubic uh, nature, the fact that there is uh, optical anisotropy, uh, and we see differences in contrast because of that, right? All right, these non-cubic metals and other materials that have this optical anisotropy um, have contrast because if we go back and look at this elliptical uh, spiral um, wave, that allows us, when we have this um, these polarizers crossed, it allows the amplitude uh, to be high. Uh, whereas uh, in a normal case with non or with cubic uh, or uh, an isotropic material, it would not allow light to go through these polarizers. So you can kind of think of this um, this crossed orientation that we have in polarized light microscopy, um, and the fact that only um, anisotropic materials can get this sort of spiral um, wave that can allow uh, light to be transmitted through this uh, cross polarized where normally uh, the light would be dark so um, as you look and if you have polarizers you'll notice that when you cross them uh, no light goes through but if you put something with um, optical anisotropy between them the light can spiral and therefore make it past the analyzer in this case. And that's what gives us the, the contrast. So we see it here with titanium, and we can also see it, this might look familiar, um, with an image of a crystallized polymer. In this case, HDPE, high density polyethylene. Um, again, they form into what we call spherulites, uh, which are regions of crystalline and non-crystalline. But when we move those polarizers, we can see the variation in the crystalline regions, which is why we're getting these uh, contrast differences from the non-cubic nature of that crystal structure. So polymers, most of them are non-cubic um, crystal structures like titanium. And so that's what allows us to use polarized light microscopy uh, in those cases. So we get contrast in those different regions of these sphere lights. Um, whereas if we do this without polarized light, we tend to not get the same level of contrast. So if we look at this in cases where we have uh, just bright fields, so no polarized light, we don't tend to get the same contrast as we do uh, in these cases. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is that if we look at isotropic materials, that includes amorphous materials, but also cubic materials, they tend to, again, not exhibit contrast in polarized light microscopy uh, because um, they cannot change the, the orientation of that polarized light through the analyzer, and therefore we get zero um, uh, amplitude. But if you, for example, stretch a isotropic material, you can actually induce anisotropy. And so that's an important uh, distinction to make as well. So it can be used in some cases to sort of ex uh, to look at stress and strain uh, in stretched materials as well.